Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Speakeasy. Uh, tonight, I'm your barista, Jeff Belanger, because we're not having drinks. We're having tea because we can do that, too. We can do anything. And I'm just happy to connect with you guys because, like you, I'm locked in. So this is an opportunity to connect with each other, to have a few drinks and socialize a bit, even if it's just virtually. I'm excited about my guest this afternoon. Uh, he's British, which is another reason why we're having tea. He's a storyteller, a humorist. Uh, he's from England. He's been telling stories to audiences all over the world. And uh, he's a guy living in New Hampshire right now. So let's just meet him. Please welcome Simon Rooks. Hi, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Good. Yeah, there it is. Here's my, here's my tea. All right, what are you drinking? Please tell us specifically. So um, a blend which I made myself. It's an Irish breakfast with some Assam mixed into it. Um, dry, it's um, dry leaf tea. It's not tea bag or anything like that. So that that's what I like. I do like mixing my teas sometimes. Okay, so um, now I'm going to look like a fool because <laughs> I've. That's all right. No, that's I've got... it's a constant comment. There's nothing yes. but constant comment. <laughs> all right, do you know that? Do you know there's a bit of a story? Um, are you a Leonard Cohen fan? Um, I, I, I've heard some of his songs and I like some of his songs. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So he has a song called, um, Suzanne. Okay. And, um, and she feeds you tea and oranges that come all the way from China. And he's referring to the tea constant comment, which is, oh. um, had just sort of come out at the time. So I take my tea with just a little bit of milk, which me is, too. yeah, kind of British of me, if you think about it. Right, it is unless it's like a herbal tea. Is it a black tea or is it a herbal? It's tea? it's black. Yeah, it's black. Okay, yeah, yeah. So that's that's very that's in. So tell British. me, <laughs> yeah, right, very British. So where did, where did were you born in England? Well, I was born in, in a place called Tufnell, uh, which is yep. in, in the area of Dudley, um, in the, what they call the Black Country, uh, so called because of all the soot that would cover everything in this black film. So like the houses, the buildings, everything was covered in soot. So they called it the black country because it was very industrialized. Um, but at a very young age, uh, my parents moved me and my brother to Worcester, and that's in England. Right. And that's where I grew up, and that's where I spent most of my formative years. In fact, all of my formative years. After. And I live not too far from Worcester, Massachusetts. So right. uh, we, of course, every every New England town comes from <laughs> some uh, some name in England, of course. So. It does. Uh, I want to tell people I met Simon. I, I met him at the unveiling of the U.S. Postal Service's Halloween stamp. Yes. Which was in, yeah. Milford, New Hampshire this past October. And uh, oh, are you pulling out the thing they gave us? What? No, I'm going to pull out the stamps. Oh, the, good. Because the thing, <laughs> don't tell anyone, but it's up in the attic. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But it's, it's right, a nice on. frame. My wife just didn't want to look at it year round. Whoops. I hit the wrong button didn't you <laughs> so my wife wasn't a big fan of the huge poster but we had this this big old this was the stamps and and jeff and i went on this um reveal um where the stamp first became public and, and jeff and i and uh there was a guy from the post office who was a super nice guy he was yeah. really nice, wasn't he? he was a great guy and the the woman that was organizing the event she was excellent and we had the mayor of Milford. Is that right? Uh, the mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah the mayor of Milford. He was there as well doing things. And um, some chamomile. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and look at Carl. Carl is a fellow Brit. He's watching from England right now. So he's probably oh, well, he's... Into, uh, well into hey, the, the booth by, by now, I imagine. Um, yeah, yeah, I would imagine he's got a dimple mug or a sleeve or something like that. <laughs> so I, look, I, I, I have it. I there you go. The there thing. it is. Yeah, ready? So here we go. We'll go uh, full screen here. So this is what they gave us, which is very fancy, right? That was the stamp. So it was oh, cool because cool. Yeah. yeah, you told a story and, and uh, I talked a little bit about the history of Halloween. And I said, wow, this guy's really interesting. And when we were doing this, I wanted to uh, I wanted to talk to all kinds of folks. And you're a storyteller. I'm a storyteller, mm -hmm. too. But we do things yeah. pretty differently. So we I do. thought we could have a cup of tea and talk about what makes a good story yeah I, I yeah i think any well the beginning middle and end i think <laughs> there's that right <laughs> yeah yeah um i don't know what does make a good story i think it's got to be something that catches your attention mm -hmm. um 
So, you know, talking about the things that you do, the, the ghosts and the ghost stories. Yeah, don't let that distract you. These people are just going to keep making comments. I know. You're just like, a lot going on. <laughs> there is a lot going on. But I yeah. them. There you go. Just bourbon and coke. Nice. Yeah. Well done, Carl. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, yeah, I think with ghost stories, there's a lot of really good ghost stories out there. But to tell them, they don't, they don't always come off very well because they come off as kind of like news reports sometimes. Right. Sure. Yeah. And for me, that, that it lists the facts. but it, story um i'll give you a, for instance i was doing a workshop with a bunch of high school kids and there was this this, this one particular young woman who was being very annoying she had her phone out and she's like texting with people and i said can you put that down and well right. i'm not getting into all the details of that but i had her tell us a story and her her story was um i i got on a atv and i crashed it and i was like well that's not really a story that's two things that happened. So I said, yeah. what happened? And she said, well, you know, I, I was on, was it, I said, was it the first time I went on an ATV? She said, no, no, no. I was at my grandmother's house up in Maine and, and they, they had a couple of brand new ones. They just got them. And I was like, so whereabouts in Maine is it? It's like this seven acres of land. And I said, so what happened? She said, well, I was bored. And so I decided to take my grandmother's brand new ATV out for a ride. And I was like, did you ask her? And she said, no. I said, so you stole it. And she said, I was like, well, you didn't ask. You didn't ask permission. So, right, you did really steal it. And right. So what are you wearing? Were you wearing leather jacket and, like, protective pants and a crash helmet? She said, no, I had a little vest top and a little pair of shorts. And I was like, this is this is kind of getting into a good story. Uh, right. Like, this is a story. And we, what ended up coming out of me pulling questions from her was that she stole this thing. She had this little singlet on and a little pair of shorts. And her cousin, her guy cousin, was on the back of it. And they took off. And her grandmother came out and got on the other ATV and started chasing after them. And they were going so hard and fast around this like seven acres of wilderness property up in Maine that she lost control of the bike on a corner and, and, and hit this tree. They both got on it and they got back to the house and they parked it back in the garage in the barn or wherever it was before her grandmother got back and they went upstairs and, and nobody found out. And I was like, that's a great story. So tell me what the story was. Tell me the story. And she said, well, I, I, I took my grandmother's ATV and I crashed it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right. That's not a story. <laughs> yeah. No. I, so from my perspective, one of the problems with uh, ghost stories is that I, I dabble in this whole like paranormal realm. And in the paranormal, people are trying to take this quite seriously. Like they're real. We can document yeah. them. We can fo maybe photograph them, record them in some way. And so when you start saying, yeah, but there's, you're chasing a story first, right? I mean, you, yeah. you heard, you heard an old building was haunted. You heard something that tingled you inside, you know, yeah. that there was an unsolved murder in this old house. It's abandoned and, and, you know, people are going there to, to, to have ghost experiences. That's, that's titillating. That's exciting. But then when they get there, they want to drop the story suddenly and just be, try to be scientific and objective about it. But uh, the, the problem is that at first you're always chasing a story. There's a reason you don't go and investigate the Walmart that was built three months ago and it's right. boring, right? You're like Indian burial ground or something. No, no, just over there by what used to be a swamp, you know? And, uh, yeah. it, it, it's so there, there's a narrative that we expect to ghost stories, to ghostly legends. And the narrative of the Walmart built on the swamp three months ago doesn't fit. It's the old spooky house where the murder happened and it's unsolved and someone's still crying out for justice. Yes. And those, those are the elements that get you excited first. If you want to be scientific about it, that's fine. I mean, you go ahead and you, you spend all night in there with thermometers and EMF meters and thermal cameras, whatever, right? But yeah. uh, what, what gets me most excited is that story. And when you hear something, the, the thing about a story is that there must be some piece of it that you connect with. Yeah. And in a ghost story, I think that connection is it sounds true or true enough. It hits some nerve in you where you go, oh, it's probably not, but maybe, right? Maybe there's you want to, Yeah, you want to believe it, right? Yeah, right. Of course. Because it's like it's such a good story. I, I want it to be true. Please let it be true. And 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 that's that's what's so amazing about ghost stories, because they are so fantastical. You know? Right. It's, you know what, what draws me to folk and fairy tales and not you know i'd like to s state right now that i don't do the moth personal narrative stories generally speaking once in a while very rare while i might 
do one of two stories that I tell. Yeah. Uh, I tell folk and fairy stories, myths and legends. And so for me, it's that this could be really, really possibly true, you know, at some point in history, right? Um, stories like Hansel and Gretel could be based on truth because, you know, in the olden days, people were abandoned in the woods if they were starving because to be eaten by wild animals is, is more terrifying but quicker than starving to death, which is a really long and painful process. Um, yes, the story has to be authentic. That is very true. But even, even a ghost story um, or e any kind of story, if it's a fairy tale, if you tell it with authenticity, right, if you tell it from, from, from your authentic self, to the authentic audience that you're hopefully telling a story to, then they'll they'll fall into that tale, and they will become engrossed in it, and they'll they'll see it in their imagination. If I'm doing my job properly, they'll see it in their imagination, and and I'm not there on the stage. I've gone. I'm, they're not seeing me. They're just hearing my words and seeing whatever they're seeing in their heads, and that is is the magic of stories. And I think ghost stories and those like you know those legends of um, mythical mystical. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to freak my mum out because I would go and find those small graveyard, the grave areas where they had the foot stone yeah. and the stone. And I would walk around until it, I found one that fit me. And I would lay down and close my eyes and do this. And my mum would be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm imagining That's what twisted. Six feet. Yes, I was very twisted. <laughs> Nothing much right. changed. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, for, for sure. You're right, Hatch. Yeah, there's got to be some sort of reasonable plausibility to it. Um, yeah. I get it. I get it for yeah. sure. Uh, so, um, sadly, we're in strange times where we're not allowed yeah. to get together. And uh, I asked this question of you, and believe it, uh, believe me, I'm asking it just as much of myself. What is a storyteller without an audience right now? Well, I, you're an audience right now. Uh, Right, that's true. Yeah, and all the people that are, are in on this show right now in your speakeasy, they're they're an audience. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, it is kind of weird, but yeah, um, it's <laughs> you you as, you can't tell a story without an audience, and an audience right. could be like somebody online, or it could be my family. You know, I got I got a fourteen year old girl coming on thirty, and I've got a nineteen year old boy who's very much nineteen years of age coming on twenty, and. Uh, you know, so they'll listen to some of my stories. Um, That's good. They're still yeah, my, listening, but they listen to you at all. I mean, is it? Yes. Right? Well, yes. You have to catch your moment, though. That's right. Sure. right. <laughs> do you, do you weave it, so do you weave it in? You're, you're, you know, you're telling a story, and then the hook hand came around the corner and empty the dishwasher. And yeah, no, I don't do that. Clean your room. <laughs> and then out of nowhere. Right? <laughs> well, my wife, she can't stand ghost stories. Oh, no. It, yeah, it it drives me nuts that it drives me nuts because like there are so many good spooky stories out there and some of them are really you know they're clever, they're brilliant, they've got a real a real heart to them. And and you, when you try and te you know tell somebody that that doesn't want to listen to that like no 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 you can't right. oh, but it's such a good story please let me tell please let me tell. I'll go and find my my son or my daughter. My daughter, she's usually up for it. Actually, she's she's more up for the spooky stories than the other two. Yeah. Do, do you have a favorite kind of story that you like to tell? Do you like the the children's stories? You said Hansel and Gretel and and stuff like that. And you've got people coming. This is real, right? This is yeah. This it, it is real. It, it, this is my son. This is my nineteen year old that I was just talking about. This Hello. Is, so he he's one of my listeners. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Thanks and for yes. being Simon's audience right now. Yeah, they went they, they went out. Yeah, they went out. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I left the door open. <laughs> it's totally fine. I mean, you know, shoot, my I have a pet parakeet who flew in the other night on one of these things. So why not? Right? Yeah, right, right. Uh, Michael, I'm not going to give you marriage advice, but I'd say divorce your <laughs> wife. <laughs> That's just no, me. No, don't do that. Don't no, do that. don't do that. Don't do that. All right. No, no. Yeah. No, but it, so it's, it's a strange time. Um, you know, creative people, I, I think uh, some of, especially storytellers, right? You almost have to be an introvert, extrovert. Yeah. Intro, introvert when you're gathering. There's a name for that. Oh, is it? Please. What is it? I can't, I can't remember, but we were looking at, because my daughter, she said, you're an extrovert dad. And I was like, not really. Right, right. He says, but you walk up to people and start talking to them in shopping lines and stuff. And I was like, well, I'm curious about people. You know, um, yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm an extrovert. I'm an extrovert on stage. And then 
we were looking up the meaning of the word and uh when it came up there was this other word as well which was it it was um it's a an introvert who can be extrovert it was I, like, right. I wish i could remember i should have written it down I'm but horrible. we have google someone look this up yeah. a bunch of you watching here yeah please do so oh yes let, let us know because it's <laughs> No, no but it's I'll get a T-shirt that says on there. Right. This, is what, this is what I am. You, you I like said, your shirt actually. I, I just noticed it. I know. I thought you were going to wear a bow tie, so uh, I um, I got gussied up in the tuxedo <laughs> printed T-shirt, which uh, well, I could go and grab a bow tie and I could put it on. No, right? no, that would be weird. Ambivert. Yes, that's it. Amnivert. Okay. Ambivert. Yes. Thank let you, me Andrew. Down, so I don't forget. It. That's that's me. I'm an ambivert. Yeah. See, isn't this great to have help? I mean, it could be just the two of us. Then we've got folks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Andrew, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, but I, so for creative people right now, uh, when I heard what was going down and they told us, you know, three weeks, and of course you start to realize it's going to be longer than that. Oh yeah. And I know now uh, here in Massachusetts, the schools are closed until May 4th, Star Wars day. May the 4th be with you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's like, wow. All of April was sounded pretty daunting to me the other day. And <laughs> hello. Oh, <laughs> They're all the way in the kitchen. We can ignore them right now. <laughs> it's so the uh, so the, the the crazy thing is like part of me is like okay, I'm I'm gonna work on some new books that that I've been meaning to write. I've been meaning to get to, and uh, I'm gonna work update my website. I'm gonna do all these things. Right. But man, I miss people, which is what this I do. Is yeah, born from that, you know. And I miss audiences, and so this is helpful. oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm the kind of guy that, um, and I I don't know if you, I, I'm hazarding a guess that you might be the same, Jeff. Is that um. If you're sitting around in, in a crowded place, um, you might start up a conversation and say, hey, you know, what do you think about the paranormal? Because I'm like, you know, if I see a yeah. bunch of kids sitting together, you know, I'll go over, hey, you want to hear a story? You yeah. know, you know for, for, a guy, for a guy doing this, you know, it's like, what are you doing, creepy old man? And it's like, I'm a storyteller. Like, I want to tell you a story. It's, it's cool. I'm it's a storyteller. Cool. Yes, like, yes. We, Honest. We, we, here's my credentials yeah we need like a, an id badge or something and, uh, <laughs> right so, so how, how is a storyteller made uh you've got the english accent so already you're miles ahead of so many of us but um, well, i'm over here but go back over to the uk i'm just like one of the yeah. other, just like one of the other guys but so, so yeah. what what when did you find your love of of getting in front of people and spinning a yarn well i mean it's I, you know my mum she always jokes about me being, you know, came out of the womb telling stories. Mm -hmm. and I, there, there's, something, there's some truth to that. Um, and, and I used to, so I, I guess when I really started telling stories, I, I used to like mimicking cartoons and comic voices and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then my, when my mum would have these dinner parties with my stepdad, uh, it was a whole bunch of teachers and they get around and we'd be sent to bed because we were still young and, um, I'd come down and listen because they'd be all laughing. And I'd be like, well, what are they laughing at? Because I'm curious. And and uh, I'd go down and I'd listen to these stories and some of the stories I would remember. And then I'd go to school the next day and tell these stories to the kids at school because these stories were sometimes a little bit rude. Sometimes they're really funny. And and I, I wouldn't say I was the class clown, but I was the guy that knew a lot of really good jokes and, and some really like grown up jokes. And so I'd be, that, that became a, a savior for me. And that's how I started. Sure. Um, yeah. Then I wrote a lot of stories and I used to read the stories. To, I, then I ended up running youth hostels uh, in the UK, Eastbourne and Hastings, Hastings, Eastbourne and Hastings right. and, and Burley all along the South Coast. And so I used to take these stories that I'd written and read them to the kids so that the parents could have some downtime or if it was a school group, then the teachers could have some downtime. You know, because unless you're in a, in a quarantine situation like this, Parents and their kids are very rarely together 24-7. Yeah. And it's a shock to the parents when it happens. And the teachers aren't with the kids 24-7. So it's kind of a shock for them. So I'd take the kids and sit them in the living room and we'd all be together. And there'd be maybe a teacher or two listening as well, parent or two. And I'd tell them these stories. And then I went to see the storyteller, which I hadn't seen since I was in elementary school, probably. And I thought, wow, these stories are so much better than anything I've ever written. And so I started telling folk and fairy tales. And that's, that's basically how I got into it. Thank you, Rick Madden. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's it's uh, it's never one thing. It's always one step and then another and then another. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, and I, yeah. I really believe that storytelling finds people. And maybe it's the same with you. Yeah. And uh, also, I mean, there are storytellers that would never call themselves storytellers, right? There's uh -huh. people who work in corporations and uh, 
uh, or sales, right? <laughs> Often oh, a good yeah. salesperson is a good storyteller. Uh, yeah, it'll do this, this, and this, I swear. <laughs> and you believe them. Oh. And, you, and you're like, really? This, this car can drive on water, like across the lake? Oh, yeah. Huh. I, I believe you. I worked, let's, let's try yeah, it. I worked with, uh, with a telecommunications company for a while, and, and um, that was an interesting experience. Yeah, yeah right, well, right. actually, Andrew, um, isn't, isn't a great storyteller a liar? Well, there are there are liars. There are professional liars. Yeah, right. What they do is they tell tall stories about themselves, about you know my aunt and uncle that you know lived down Little Bottom Street. Except, yeah, you know, my aunt and uncle had really large bottoms. And you think of a large bottom. I'm talking about you know you could you couldn't even get them on a golf cart kind of large bottom and they had tiny little heads. And so you, that, that's a liar story right there. Right. Well, I mean, any movie you've ever seen in Hollywood, right? Someone's lying to you. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, a, a galaxy far, far away, a long time ago. I mean, you know, come on. They're, Star Wars is real though. <laughs> darn right. So, so, so they're lying to you, but we buy into the lie because we want to, and we suspend right. our disbelief because we want to be there and we want to escape whatever that thing is. Right. Uh, that, that's the mechanics of the story. There's there's a two way street. You have to participate. And what I love, love, love about the live audience is when you get that immediate feedback. When you know they are yeah. they're with you. And because right. what's amazing in the fall, I do I do my stories every night. I, I go and I I talk about various haunts and legends and things like that. And I've got pictures from the places. And it's just this whole program. It's a it's a show uh, with no apologies. And you go out there one night, and man, they're in the palm of your hand they're every word you say they're just hanging and they laugh when they're supposed to laugh and they get choked up when they're supposed to get choked up and you're like this is i'm a god among men this is amazing <laughs> and the next night you go you know a uh, hundred miles away to, and, and you do the same show for an entirely different audience and you're just like you're dying out there you're going but last <laughs> night last night this was gold it worked everything worked yes. what's it's not me it's you what what's what's wrong what, well, what there's, there's all sorts of different factors, right? I mean, there's yeah. the you, right? There's the audience, there's the story, and there's yourself, right? right. There's, there's the environment, not just the venue, but the environment, uh, which is part of the venue. And all of those things are con uh, contributing to, to the performance of what we do. Um, and I think the difference between um, what you and I do as a live storytelling event, and I know that what we do is slightly different, but it's, it's very similar is that there's no fourth wall right but we are talking to the audience we are being real with the audience let's come in this is my wife oh, I'm good. she's not coming hello i don't know how many people are watching she wants to know um i it's, it's tough to tell at the time i mean at any given time we're probably about 50. oh there she goes <laughs> about 50. yeah but who will see it later? I mean, it, 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 it's been hundreds. <laughs> do you know what she just said? <laughs> who are these people? Haven't they got anything better to do? <laughs> uh, no, we're all under quarantine. <laughs> I know, right? I don't know if you've heard. There's this thing going around. We're stuck. <laughs> we are very different human beings, I tell you. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. Yeah, there's we're we're stuck, and uh, and and I think that's part of it. Uh, one of the things that when I did this the first night, uh, Sunday night, with my friends Brad and Tim from Michigan, uh, who are they're paranormal guys that throw this huge conference out in Michigan, and the best part of the event is when the the day's events are done and we all meet at the bar at this mm -hmm. big big casino. And we just drink and tell stories. And, and uh, I said, boy, I miss you guys. Maybe we could just do that virtually. And people said, wow, I felt like I was doing something social for the first time in two weeks. And so um, maybe, you know, today it's tea. Beer and right. wine and booze isn't everyone's cup. So let's try, right. uh, you know, stories and tea. And uh, I was telling you earlier that I, um, my wife and I we went to, I just want to, it's not really a plug, but it kind of is. Went to oh, go ahead. Silo Distillery up in Windsor. Vermont. Yeah. And uh, they're giving away free hand sanitizer. And so we wanted to support them. And they, they only make cider and whiskey. I'm not a big whiskey drinker, but they had this maple whiskey. And, oh, 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 it is so good. If you like Southern Comfort and you like maple and you like whiskey, it's that is a really good whiskey to try. So thumbs up to Silo. Yeah. No, well, I, and, and I think it's interesting how innovative some of the local bars and restaurants are getting. Yeah. There's some brew pubs near me that uh, are offering a takeout service where you, you just right. pull up the car, 
you don't even get out. You just tell them what you want and or they hold up a menu and they'll go get it for you. They wear gloves and you just sw you swipe your credit card. You don't even have to sign and you keep driving and you're helping to keep that that local you know brew pub open until this thing passes over. So right. yeah. It used to be called a drive in. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No. Back in the fifties, right? And they wear roller skates and they come in and out. And and now we've got uh, we've got it back again, but we have to be innovative. And and as yeah. uh, as storytellers, I feel like now there's an opportunity too. Uh, one of the things that's been so difficult for me, uh, I, I I write the show Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel. I do the research and right. writing of that, and we're, we're we've stopped filming because people can't travel and we can't get right. the crew anywhere. And so I, I feel like I've often neglected my own audience because I also write books and I do my own programs. And I thought, well, this is a time you've got a lot of stuff out. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, nothing pays all that well. So I, you know. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> so if I do like 20 things, look at that. Oh, the, the haunted New England calendar. Well the done. The haunted sir. New England calendar hangs up next to my desk because I love the pictures and the stories. Cheers, yeah. And uh, in fact, one of the things that I'm going to do is now we're all quarantined. I think my son and I might go and explore some of those like out of the way places that are on the calendar. And there's so many out of the way places. Wow. There are there locations. Are that are out in the woods, that are, you know, all kinds of uh, opportunities to see things and do things that um, maybe we don't get to do the rest of the rest of the year. Yeah, uh, right. I'm also, I'm an avid hiker and I'm trying to get up to the White Mountains there because, uh, but from what I hear, it's getting crowded. <laughs> it's Well, yeah. Um, so there's, there's a guy up here who I follow on Instagram and he, I think they've closed a lot of these places down because of that. Um, I know that a lot of people from, um bigger cities like boston have second homes up here so a lot of those 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 rich folk are actually moving up to new hampshire and maine and they're going to all these you know places out in the woods where nobody should normally be and it's it's becoming a problem because you know it's like going to central park in new york right and suddenly it's getting crowded so, yeah and everyone's crowded now the police have got to step in and say no more than two people together <laughs> which is tricky to do if you're halfway up mount washington yes right. Right. It is. So, like, we're going to hide in the trees for a little while and you can walk by. <laughs> right. Yeah. Give us six feet at least. So speaking yeah. of Instagram, I follow you on Instagram. There you are. And I follow you. And uh, uh, you're also a photographer. You do a lot of your own photography. It's fun to watch that. I love creative people. I like people that uh, uh, a friend of mine who's a photographer in California had once made the comment that you, you learn a lot about a person, a, a photographer especially, by, by their photos, right? Because you start to yes. see you start to see a pattern as when you look at a bunch of photos over time, you see the angles that they like to take and the, and the subjects right. that tend to pull them in. Your dog is obviously uh, your big fan, <laughs> right? And um, she's the only one in my family that doesn't mind being photographed. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of camera shy people in this house. Right. And then nature. Well, you're, you're, you're yeah. Well, it. yeah. I mean, I think some of it is, yes, there's an, there's, there's a huge amount of truth in that. I, I believe what your, your friend says there, but I think also, as an element of the environment that we're that we're in, um, so I'm stuck in New London, New Hampshire, New England, New World. In the you know, it's it's not in the middle of nowhere, but it's it is in the middle of the country, um, and we have these amazing hiking trails that you can go on. And so I walk the dog in on one of those trails most days, um, and so that's what I take photographs of. Um, when I do trips to New York City, I'm taking pictures of like this the city. Yes, you can. Well, just follow yeah. him on Instagram. Go, go yeah, follow me on Instagram. There's, yeah, there's a ton Andrew. of pictures up there. In fact, yeah, if, you, if you use the hashtag in the woods with Mo, and that's M O E, then you'll uh, you'll you'll find a lot of pictures of, of Mo and the hikes that I, that I do. Mo, I don't know what Mo's doing. I think she just got back from her walk with 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 mom and and my daughter. So uh, very nice. Yeah, the couch right now. <laughs> Now you also I see that, uh, CDs. You put out CDs of your stories, and I, I, I have one of those. Yeah, go ahead, hold it up, plug it, do well, it. I, yes, I um I don't they not all of them are here, but I did Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which my son did the illustration for that, uh, which got a gold award from Parents Choice, which I was very chuffed with because I actually recorded that and produced it all by myself. This is a very poor resolution image. Of the first CD that I did, which is called Secondhand Tales, there's also more Secondhand Tales. Those are two family CDs. And then there's this one, which is called A Tangle of Tales. 
and that's for more older kids and adults. And then there's also this one, which is Moonlit Tales, which is also uh, more adult and older kids. But I'm also I'm working on a new family CD right now as we speak. Um, although the band well, not as we speak, because otherwise, yeah, yeah. yeah. I could practice all the stories on you. <laughs> oh, look, yeah. So um, Mo's got a comment. We listen to your guest ho uh, hosting gig on Story Story. Yes, I also do that too. Yes, Mo knows. She's another story. She's a fine storyteller. Mo, okay. Mo, Mo Reynolds is up near Alaska. No, she's not. She's in Montana. Yeah. Next to the Canadian border. And and she's uh, she's a really good storyteller. And she has a, a YouTube channel called, I think it's called Miss Mo. Um, and she deals with a lot of like preschool, younger elementary age kid stuff. And she's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Highly recommend. Are you going to yeah. give her, her girls what they want or here or not? Are you going to just leave oh, them hang on. On. Listen to your guest hosting gig on story story. And the girls love you. Oh, buns from the bakery. Yes. Just say buns from the bakery. I guess you're saying from the bakery. Yes. She likes the, the other words. They're like a governor. Cause you know, all right, governor, how you doing? Uh, hey. Hello, gov. Yes. Right. When I'm, when I'm in the UK, I find that I, uh, I, I adopt, I don't mean to, I, it must sound like I'm mocking everyone, but I can't help it. I just, I just, hello, gov, what's all this? Cheers. Right. I mean, <laughs> and they just shake their heads and ignore you. They right? Oh, they're like, uh, <laughs> you know what I love? Can you do an American accent? All Brits can. I, no. I would, you come on. Well, I do a really bad Southern accent. No, no. I'm just a straight American Midwest, nothing accent. I can't, I, I can't oh. do it. <laughs> All right, and I've lived I've lived in New Hampshire for oh gosh a long time, a really long time, and we used to live next door to this this patriarch of this very New Hampshire family. Yeah. who had a, a remarkably strong New Hampshire accent, and when we used to walk our kids to the bus stop, I'd listen to her every day, and it, I'd try and emulate her accent because I like I love accents, and I couldn't do it. I I don't know why. So the, the only accent I can do is one of those Southern draw things. And I think if I went down South, I'd end up talking like this the whole time. And people would be thinking, he's taking the piss, man. Right. No, they don't say that. Down there. <laughs> they don't do that. What do they say? Oh, they're making fun of me. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, see. Oh, uh, America <laughs> watching Doctor Who. Yeah. Doctor Who got big over here. Uh, thanks to BBC America. Um, yes. Yes. Count myself. We've just got BBC America, and I can watch Doctor Who again, and it's very exciting. Except they're not filming anything anymore. I know. Virus. Yeah. Every, well, that's that's everything. So we're we're left. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe everything maybe the, is shut down. It's all shut down. So maybe the time of the storyteller uh, reemerging, right? I, I mean, so. storytellers uh, have had a place in society for all of human history, all of it, right? Second oldest profession. Yeah. <laughs> It's a toss up, right? <laughs> For sure. And, and so I, I almost wonder, Sorry. you know, and we were at a place, by the way, and you mentioned the moth earlier, and I have yeah. done some of those story nights. Uh, oh, and yeah. I love, I haven't done moth, but I've done like it, like in the spirit yeah, yeah, yeah. of moth, you just tell a personal story in like five minutes or six minutes. And I, I love listening to the moth podcast. I, I, I really feel like we're in a place recently where. Uh, people were connecting with storytellers again in a way yeah. I haven't seen in my lifetime. And I'm talking only in the last year, two years, three years. Like it's really, I've seen this build. Um, or yeah, maybe I pay more attention to it. I think maybe you'll pay more attention to it. I would, I would say the last five years. Um, okay. I mean, when the moth came out and, and got big. I mean, it started in this guy's house. Right. Um, and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and then it just blossomed. And I think there's... You know the whole competition thing. It's like poetry back in the eighties and nineties with these poetry slams. It got that got huge, and I think this connection with story. To, I mean, it's it's deep within us, right? I mean, we all get around the water cooler or or in a coffee shop and we start talking to each other. It, telling stories is, is innate in our in our in our DNA, if you will, and uh, I think the moth has like brought that out. And I'm, what I'm hoping is is that you know the traditional stories can can Combine more. What's the moth? Oh, the moth is. Um, you're in England, right, Andrew? Is it that? No, I think Andrew's in the US. But please. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so the moth is. Um, the moth is like a big story slam, um, and it can be really, really good. Like Jeff said, it can be amazing, um, and it's it has to be a true story, and it has to be something that you either happened to you or you actually witnessed happening, and it's without a script. And people get in these large groups in a pub 
in, in Boston. I think they have something like that. But they do have something like that called Mass Mouth. Um, and they've yep. had, I think they've also had the moth there in Boston, maybe at the I've seen it in Boston. Yeah, they had it in Cambridge. Okay. I forget the venue, but I've seen it. I've seen Moth Live in Cambridge. Okay. And, and people get up and they tell a story and people get, you know, there's winners and losers, um, which is one of the things I don't really like about that. Completely agree with you. The stories are fantastic. I don't like that they're literally ranked on like a one to 10 scale. Right. Um, that's because that's someone's personal story. It's about their life. And it's how can you, you know, I hear a boring fart. You know, I don't want to listen to you. It's like, right. That, that kind of bothers me. You know? it, it, it bothered me too, especially because the one I went to, uh, the, the person who won, like if it were me, my favorite story was not the winner. Like my favorite story yeah. was someone I said that I, this guy was great. I would listen to this guy all night and someone else won. And uh, they told a, a more, one of those like heart wrenching, someone died of cancer and, yeah. and, and you know, you're like, Oh, you got extra points just for that. And I don't right. mean to be a jerk. I mean, it's a horrible story <sighs> and, and we all, we all, you know, it's, it's a story of loss, but it almost felt like a sympathy vote. I mean, are we being really yeah. objective here or are we just saying, man, you tugged my heartstrings. Yeah. But if we're really, you know, objective, the other guy I thought was just a better storyteller. Right, right. And I do think that sometimes happens is is that the, the the story of grief and because I think it it really does play on our sympathies because, you know, right. I, I think most of us are very sympathetic and em empathic to to each other. You know, if, if someone gets hit in the face, we all flinch, right? And there are some of us that are, that are more... <laughs> I'll tell you about oh, that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hey, You're very easily <laughs> distracted when these things go up. Like, I am. I got to. I got to block that. Right, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it there is that sympathy thing, and 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 I think it, it does play to the judges, whoever they are. Um, yeah. And there there are some stories on the moth that I've listened because I've listened to it on the radio because um, yeah. it's on on GBH, isn't it, or something yeah. like that? Yeah. And uh, there are some stories that I listen to, and I'm like, really you're telling the whole world this story that's like what i would keep to my therapist <laughs> right right and those are the ones that i, I think we lean in and but, but what i love about that is that some people are willing to stand so naked and because oh, yeah. i think that's, that's what a, a great story story is right like uh, good art is is naked it's that's yeah um, Good art, whether it's a poem, a song, uh, a dance, a performance, a story, whatever it is, is you just stripping it down and just being totally vulnerable and connecting and, with the audience, right? And and, and need to do that. I mean, there are some, there are some stories um, where you can get completely naked, and people are just looking at you like, I didn't need to see that. You know? TMI, right? Too much. Yeah, yeah, right. And there's that, that triggering effect as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've. I've done that with with um, a story by Edgar Allan Poe. I, I did a variant. I retold Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat, which is a phenomenal story. Yep. But I told it in the first person, which Poe does for a lot of his stories. So I told it in the first person, but I updated it a little bit as if I was in prison awaiting to go to um, electric chair or an injection or something like that, lethal injection on death row. And I opened up my evening with that story because I was so nervous about telling it because I'd been working on it and working on it. It's the first time I was taking it out. And <clears throat> I'd forgotten that you need to gain trust from your audience. You know, you need to be liked with your audience. Say, hey, this is who I am. We're going to go deeper now. And the audience can trust you. And what I did was like, I'm Simon. I'm going to tell you this really shit scary story. And five people, five, it was an adult only audience and five people got up and walked out because the story triggered them. And I was, I was gutted. Yeah, the walkouts, and that's all you see. Yeah, right. And it was, and I, so at the end of that story, I apologized to everybody that was there, and that wasn't my intent. I'm not that type of guy. And uh, you know, I was able to reach out to the organizers of the event, and I got in touch with a couple of the people who walked down and apologized to them because I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not the, you know, the dark, horrible person, the alcoholic, the drug user. It's like that's that's not me, you know. But right, the, right. right because I opened up with a story. They weren't sure. They didn't, they didn't have, we hadn't built that bond yet. We didn't have that trust and they couldn't take it. So they walked out, got out and walked out. So one of the interesting things is about stories, I, I was a writing major in college and I remember a, a writing professor, one I admired greatly, Sam Toporoff. He had said, as soon as you open a book, and this is true of, of a story, as soon as a movie starts, as soon as a storyteller starts to speak, as soon as a song starts to play, 
you have to, number one, grab attention, of course, mm -hmm. but you have to establish trust. And yeah. the trust is that, uh, trust me, I'm competent at what I'm doing, and right. I'm going to take you somewhere, right? We're, <laughs> you're investing your time and your energy with me, and I'm going to take you somewhere. And that's why if we read a book, especially if it's a, a good book, uh, uh -huh. and suddenly you get to the end, and the, and the ending is not satisfying. You yeah. just you want to you want to shoot somebody, right? Yeah, right. right I can well, think of all the character is so annoying, which is what I did with uh, Mexicala beans. Uh, okay. a, a good friend of my wife's, a friend of mine, he he always recommended these really good books. And I was, I'm gonna shut the door because it's getting a bit loud. Go ahead, shut the door. <clears throat> See, this is as real as it gets. This is just people living their life, right? I mean, sorry. Go ahead. Fire so I was, reading, I was reading Mexicala Beans and the, the main character in it was so whiny and obnoxious. I just, I got halfway through and I used to be like, if I start a book, I've got to finish it. And this is the first book that I didn't finish. And I threw it across the room because I hated the lead character so much, which means it was brilliantly written. Right. right? It evoked emotion, right? So the, the biggest, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, the most offensive thing you can say to an artist is I felt nothing. Eh. Right. That's that. I mean, I hate, I hate you. I love you. I'm so happy. I'm so sad. Right. That's what we do. But when it's just, I mean, I can think of paintings I've seen in art museums where I just look and I go, I feel absolutely nothing. It's just yeah. a, a, a splotch of paint on a canvas. It evoked right. nothing in me, but art is subjective. Of course, someone else yeah. could walk by and just, you know, uh, fall to their knees crying and think this is the most powerful piece they've ever seen. And I just right. go, I would pay you 10 bucks to take it off the wall. Right. Just, <laughs> I mean, th that's uh, that's 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 what art is, and not everyone's going to agree on what's that's scary, true. and th and that's the working in ghost stories. Uh, fear and humor are the two most challenging yeah. for me, anyway. Like the the two most challenging aspects of a story, uh, because what scares you may not scare me, and what right. you find funny, you know, I have a I have the sense of humor of like a boy stuck in fifth grade. So <laughs> if you want to talk about <laughs> yeah, you know, if you want to talk about farts and stuff, I will laugh. Yeah all live long day yeah. and and i i've learned as an adult that not everyone thinks farts are funny i mean i know it's not it's weird it's we all do it right it's crazy. Yeah. so uh, so at the same time i think that uh, uh so if you're going to dabble in those those things emotion we can all relate to loss i feel like that's yeah. that's almost a, an easy one almost cheating mm -hmm. sometimes right we can we can talk about losing someone or something and and that love, one, that's another love right can, yeah and love, of course, broken heart, right, is, is yeah. the next step after that. And so, uh, yeah, so all those all those elements, but also a great story doesn't just hit one of those notes, right? right. A, a good ghost story ha should have humor in it. It, it, oh, yeah. it, it disarms you. It, it lets your guard down, and then we can scare. And that's, right, right? that's well, the... Yeah, I mean, that's what you do. You, you, you make sure people are having fun, and you build up the tension, and you build it up, and then you explode with this really dark and powerful thing and people are just like, <sighs> yeah. Then like a little bit later, you bring in a joke and it, <sighs> you feel the room relaxing and people calming down and it's like, all right, we're safe again. You know? Yeah. I, I think of uh, Hitchcock, oh, films, right? Yeah. Hitch Hitchcock right. was a master at this. So, so the woman's walking down the hallway and the camera cuts and you know, the killer's behind the kitchen door. He's right there yeah. and she's getting closer and the music's building and, and it's taken a long time to walk. Oh, yeah. And you are just so tense. And then the they, phone rings. The phone yes. rings. Like, ring, and everybody leaps. And you, oh my gosh. Woo, and yeah. she picks up the phone. Hello. And you calm down. And then the killer comes out. And then he gets you again. And yeah. it's, he's a master of that, right? Like yes. you're expecting this to just build to the murder. And then I, I surprise you with something that makes you laugh. Your guard's down. And then I scare you. And uh, that's, I, I'm, you're just in awe when you see, even when you know how the, how it works, when you know how the sausage is made and the mechanics of the thing, yes. when you see someone pull it on you and you, you're like, Oh, I know what you're doing and it still works. Yes. I yeah. love that. You know? Yeah. I think Sam Mendes was a huge fan of Alfred Hitchcock. It was uh, whoever the, act, the, oh, what was it called? I can't remember. It's about the, this, this naval officer who's, who's, wife is killed or no it's not his wife his son is killed in a in a car accident with his wife she's okay and so they take this yacht out into the middle of the ocean he's this great naval captain and and they pick up this guy who's on this boat right turns out to be a a, a killer a murderer and 
it's yeah hitch was definitely a must anyway i, I think it was sam mendes i can't remember the name of, of the movie but he he uses that thing the hitchcock thing is like this is what's going to happen but you don't know when it's going to happen and i think that's like the big that's the big like draw that hitchcock has yeah it's going to happen you know exactly but it's just that like when when please yeah yeah <laughs> and, 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 and it's one of the things uh, i took a um an improv class last winter just uh -huh. I, I take acting classes and improv classes just to be a better speaker. And one of the things I love about improv is the callback, right? So the yeah. callback is when you're, you know, uh, for those who may not know, when you're 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 telling a story and you might make a, a funny joke. And then you could be three stories later um, in the evening, and then you tell that funny joke from the first story, you you pull it into the story you're right. telling. And right. then that's that's called a callback. And everybody loves it because it's familiar, because they right. say, Oh, I know that. And, and, and it's like an old friend that just came in to see you. And right. uh, in a song, you would call that the chorus, right? Or, or like the hook. Yes. Like yeah, the, yeah, it, yeah. It comes back around and you go, oh, now I know the chorus. I've heard it twice now. This is the third time it's starting to be familiar. And, it's, and then it's, you can join in. Yeah, and it's it's that's right, and then it's it's working in, and that's that's what uh, that's what stories are, and I, lo I I love that I could talk about this stuff all day. I just love the mechanics of it, and even though you think you're so smart and you're such a good student of it, it's so freaking hard to do well. <laughs> yeah, and you always want to keep learning. Or I do. I I just yeah. I try to watch as many people as possible to doing their craft and doing these big you know these big national circuit festivals i get to see people from all over um you know going back to mo she's up in montana like the northernmost part of montana and she did what you said so i get up on the stage and i tell a story for these kids i completely changed my uh, set because of of these kids they were obviously tired it was it was a long day for them and i'm like don't go i've got a great story for you stay for it and i got up and i told this story and I'm shaking my bum in the audience's faces and they were loving it. The kids are laughing and everything. And then Mo, who was, I think, two storytellers later, she came in and she she was talking about this this woman shaking her bum. And, and Mo is 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 very conservative with, with her uh, physical person. And she said, well, like Simon did. Right. And so she brought what I had done into her story. And when you get a whole bunch of storytellers on the same stage, when one pulls from the other and then pulls from another, you know, it's, yeah. it's it can be a lot of fun and the audience loves it. It's just brilliant. It's so at, at these big storytelling events, is it, or is it a competition or is it just a show? No, no, it's it's so the one I'm referring to, that was the Florida Storytelling Festival, which happened in January. And there was Pete Abdullah, who was he was like the, the grandfather figure for all of us other storytellers. He was very dry, very droll, and incredibly funny. And when I, when I was sitting on the edge of the stage watching him, and the audience is out in front, I'm watching him, and he'd look down every once in a while because he tells these humdinger of a stories, and he just tells it so dry, keeps a straight. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Colin. Dead calm. That's my brother right there. Hey, Colin. Dead calm. And was it Sam Mendes who directed it? Um, but yeah, so so the Pete Abdullah was there, and so all of us got several times i think it was like three or four times um to tell with each other in different orders um and then we all had a, our own solo set right and, and there are a couple of sets where we were paired up with another storyteller so half the set was mine and half the set was diane macklin for example and she was a joy to share the stage with as well yeah no it's i i, I love the i love the craft of it um yeah, i enjoyed watching you very much when we were talking about we we're launching a stamp which is one of the strangest gigs i've had yes you know? and, uh, i can second that so, was, yeah that, you can't you know it's like when you've got like such it was for everybody on that stage it was such a teeny tiny amount of like five minutes most yeah. and you can't warm yourself up beforehand because we're all sitting on the stage waiting to do our piece and you get up and you just bleh <laughs> <laughs> so what i'll do I, I will, you can watch this whole thing uh, i have a link to it um yes. I, i'll post a link in the comments so you, you can watch it after if you want to see the whole thing you can see simon tell the story you can see me do my thing and and he's right i mean first of all it's it's a sort of like a government operation so everything was just you're next you have three minutes go you you're next and, yeah. um but it, it was uh it was the strangest thing to me was uh meeting people who said I drove, you know, 700 miles to be at this 
For the stamps. For the stamps. Yeah, not for yeah, us. Not, not for us. us. No, no, nobody. No, no, no. <laughs> no. We were just down the road and we saw that you were performing, but we came for the stamps. <laughs> yeah, 700 miles. I've been to like 87 of these things and uh, and I'm here to get the very first issue of the, the Halloween stamp. And I went, yeah. I mean, of course, of course, people love stamps, but it's just I had never visited that world. So that was really yeah. fascinating for me. Yeah. I know the closest I've ever got to it was North by Northwest. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so was, there's a thing for everything. Film, right? right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Another one. Yeah. So, but it's, that's, and I, and I thought that was really fun. Just the, the, the passion people have for stamps. Oh, yeah. uh, totally. And, and I, and I love too that the, and it was a point I tried to make with like, you know, stamps are a connection, right? Stories are a connection. Yeah. You know, right. a, stamp, a stamp can get one message from one person to another. And, uh, and that's what stories do. And uh, folklore especially is a message from the past that's being, mailed forward and and it changes of course and uh oh what did you get there so these put that on that oh, wrong way these are postcard my friend tony toledo who is i was going to tell you is a master at the jump story he likes to send postcards out and i got these three postcards from tony just the other day and show me the stamp show me the stamp oh, it's just a regular postcard oh son of a gun all right i know nothing too exciting they don't make exciting postcards i mean they're fun but they're not like but Tony is a. I, the first time I saw what Tony perform, I was in this church and he's doing ghost stories. And I'm sitting at the very back. And he got to the jump part of the story. And I swear, every single backside lifted off the pew by about six inches. The whole audience goes like this and lands back down. And I asked him afterwards, I was like, how do you keep a straight face when you do that? And then the first time I did a jump story, it was the same thing for me. Like everybody jumps up and it's, it's like the hardest thing to keep a straight face when everybody jumps up in the, in the, it's, it's when it, you do that. Uh, no, right, I got off topic there. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. Yeah, no, I get it. I, I love that part of it. I love when you, when you can, is when you can see, and, and this is something the audience doesn't get, right? When you've got a jump, you get to see, right? Yeah. They yeah. Don't. They just they just know they jumped. They can't see the whole I, sea of bodies. Like it's like the human wave at a sporting event, right? Wherever it is, but it's all at the same time. And then they yeah. start laughing because they all they all kind of know that they yeah. did that. Yeah, and that's the oh, that's the community. Again. yeah the community feel, and that's what I'm missing so badly right now because we're stuck inside. But we know we'll get out there again. We know, uh, you know, we'll we'll hibernate until then. We'll work on our craft. Yes, and, and get some new stories, right? Yeah, new stories. I'm going to try and learn the penny whistle a little bit better because I'm a bit crap at it, but I'm working on it. I was going to ask you to play the penny. No, I wasn't. I wasn't going to ask you that at all. No, don't take it out. <laughs> I won't. I won't. I'll get my get didgeridoo so fast. Like, you, I, I, you got a didgeridoo. I, I do have a didgeridoo. And and we, we could jam sometime because whatever. Why not? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, those two instruments are sort of born together, I think. I mean, I think you know. They, 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 yeah. What is it? Brothers of a different mother or something? Right. Like yes. And, and I guess if you were to look at a, the planet, they were opposite yes. sides, right? There's they Australia yeah. and, you know, England, um, Ireland. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. So there's that. But um, no, this was fun. I appreciate you uh, you joining me this afternoon. And this is what I wanted to do. I just wanted to connect. And it was fun to talk to you about storytelling. So It was. And you, you, you were telling me that you got someone teaching you to play the guitar at some point? Come well, in, in all truth, uh, I've played the guitar for 20 years. But the funny thing is the the guy that's going to join me uh, next week, John Judd, he composes all the music for my TV show, New England Legends on PBS, for oh, my nice. podcast. He's, I mean, he composes music for all kinds of people. He had a um, – some of his music was heard on a Super Bowl commercial. Like just um, – Oh, really? Nice. I mean, you know, it's just, just like a, a melody for a commercial, but he's he's a jazz player. He's teaches Makes music. more money than what you and I make, I bet. <laughs> oh, he I, he does all right. You know, but it's a hustle. It's a hustle like yeah. anything else. That's true. And, and he was uh, he was the best man at my wedding. And so now he's teaching music virtually. Right. That's that's how he's. Yes, Andrew, he's going to be on next week. I don't have a date yet, but uh, he's getting over a cold. We're working on it. So I thought like Is it just a cold. Well, that's what I said. I'm like, well, well, we'll do this virtually, and so, uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play some guitar together and just talk about music, because uh, why not? And I've got a friend on Monday. She's a chef in Texas, um, Rachel. She was uh, actually in here earlier. She's going to cook for us. She's gonna cook lunch, and we're gonna just talk about cooking. There she is. 
And uh, Rachel. Rachel, we went to high school together. So did John Judd. So Rachel's going to be on Monday. Um, I, I forget the time, but just check Facebook Live. And she's going to cook for us. She's a cook. And she's going to do uh, almost like she does. She teaches cooking. But obviously, you can't do that in person right now. So right. we're going to do it so virtually. Are you going to cook together? Is she, is she going to send you like a list? Oh, of no, 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 no. She, no? She's going to do the cooking. <laughs> I'm going to just ask questions because otherwise. you might get a big mirror up above your stove at 45. No. <laughs> you, you know why? I, I wouldn't do that to Rachel, right? Because think of how bad she'd look when she's got this like amazing thing and I'm teaching people to cook and mine's just black and on fire and the fire department's <laughs> rushing in and. And, and hey, you and, might get more watch. You know, people love a disaster, right? You might get more watches. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I don't think she would. That would help her. So I'm just gonna watch <laughs> and ask questions. I like to eat. I, I and I do enjoy to cook here and there. But but yeah. So and, and I'll have more paranormal people on too. So it's just we're having fun. We're being social. We're we're checking it out. And uh, thank you. Thank you for doing this. No, and you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I, it. I had really fun with you. Yeah. Mine's empty. I got to get it a refill. Yeah. Uh, it was great meeting you at the stamp thing, and I'm glad that you reached out and asked me to do this. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, here, wait, sorry, your brother. There's your uh, director. Oh, Philip Noyce. So he, so, yeah, Nicole Kidman. Yeah. So Philip Noyce was a big because I read about this because I love Dead Calm. It's such a great movie. Um, and uh, oh, yes. well, that's my sister-in-law. There you go. <laughs> you got your whole family here. I know. Well, I told them all that what, what was going on. I sent a little note out. So I'm glad that's that good. Nothing else better to do, apparently. <laughs> so one more plug. You can check him out, simonbrooksstoryteller.com. You can follow him on Instagram. And you can listen to my podcast. There it is, uh, New England Legends. And, you know, check Simon out. I just want to introduce you guys to different people. And also, if you feel like uh, a tip, uh, Venmo tips are accepted. There's my Venmo if anyone wants to help the cause as we uh, go forward. But anyway, yeah. appreciate you guys. Appreciate you, Simon. We'll check back in. Appreciate we'll see you, how Jeff. we're doing. Yeah. And, uh, you so. know, everyone else, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for listening. And tell a great Watch story. Often. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Take care.